Hassan Elai, welcome. Thank you. To the University of North Texas and IARTA, the Initiative for Advanced Research in Technology and the Arts. And we're here to discuss art and in the age of high security, its history, various cultural traditions that underwrite various practices. And I'd like to start by asking you to discuss how you see relationships between art and warfare. Sure. Well, I think, you know, the, the two are so closely tied together. And I think to talk about art practice and not bring the violent uh, warfare aspect of it, uh, I think, and, and particularly in, in art, an art involving technology, I think a lot of the tools that we use and, and so on, they're so closely tied that it's difficult to detach the two from the conversation. So, you know, in, for example, one of the projects that um, I've been doing where I've been tracking myself for uh, 10 years now, uh, putting, it, putting every bit of information about me out there publicly. Uh, in a way, by, by giving up all my privacy, I've become very anonymous. I've opened up every aspect of my life. And it's not that I'm hiding certain things, it's all there. But it's kind of become sort of like camouflage. There's so much noise there to figure out that signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the important part of the information? What part is, well, literally noise? And I think, I find that really interesting in looking at that and, and this concept of camouflage. And if you look at what camouflage historically was used or how it was used, uh, trees and bushes look different at every place. So therefore, everywhere, you, everywhere we would send troops, we would have different fatigues. Now, if you look at the new, uh, the new camouflage, new meaning at least since, since, the, uh, uh, since the war on terror began, uh, the invasions of, uh, of Afghanistan and Iraq, when you look at those, the pattern, and when you see the, the troops wearing that, do you notice any trees that color anywhere? You know, this grayish, greenish, kind of color, this, and, it's, and it's pixelized. It's actually literally pixels. And when you look closely, so when you're, what you're really seeing is a pixel pattern of gray and green. And of course, no, there's no trees that color anywhere. And no trees are actually that blocky thing. <laughs> right. So, so and, and as opposed to say, when you look at the, the fatigues used in Vietnam, in the jungles, you have the browns and the greens, and there would actually be these well, the, the traditional, what we associate with camouflage pattern, the woodlands pattern. So uh, I think there's a huge shift that's taking place culturally because in the past, we needed the soldier to blend in to the landscape of warfare. These days, we, have, we don't have a need for that. And these days, the reason it's pixelized is because it is those colors is because we need the soldier to blend in to the technology of the warfare. The soldier needs to embed the machinery or be embedded in the machinery. So therefore, the two cannot be distinguished. And in the same way, in, this, in, this, uh, in our day-to-day -day culture, as so much of our lives are dematerialized and so much of it is technologically based, we're not, it's not necessarily about the physical location or the physical material or the physical uh, characteristics of it, but really about the electronic and the data body. So how do, we, how do we blur into this? How do we fuzz into this? How do we create this camouflage? And how do we just keep on living in a, in a private manner where everything is archived and everything is uh, recorded and everything is tracked? Uh, and I think it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge dilemma because I think we're, we're struggling with it. And uh, we still don't know how to react to this culturally. And I think in a way, when you look at uh, different movements in, in uh, the way we've adapted to technology, I mean, the technology is moving at a specific speed and it's moving at, at, a, at, a, at a, things are, new things are coming up almost on a, on a daily basis, if not hourly, uh, things are being developed. And then say, culturally, you know, we're actually surprisingly adaptive beings and we adapt culturally pretty quickly. I mean, I'll, I'll see, you know, I'll see folks that are texting that would never be texting 10 years ago, much less 20 or 30 years ago. And it's just become a daily life. You know, we don't actually go, oh, well, 
I have to stop everything that I'm doing to look at my texts. It just happens. You just do it as your as a as your life. And in the same way, uh, but you know, then there's take like regulation of that. By the time we've come to try to come up with some sort of uh, any sort of governmental issue of it, it's so glacially slow that by the time we get around to it on an institutional level, that well, the technology is completely changed and the culture is completely changed out of it as well. So I think this is really interesting in looking at different rates of ad adapt adaptability and adaptation, but also at how the, the dematerialization of war going from, well, obviously, you know, we're, I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we're still having things that are blowing up in real life and things, but now they're just being done from a hangar in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And it's a joystick. It's no longer that soldier in there. And if it is, the enemy is seeing the soldier as a pixel through night vision goggles, rather than as a physical being, as in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, say, 200 years ago or 100 years ago. Uh, so there's a huge shift. And I think uh, so artists have always reacted to their conditions and their surroundings in different ways. And I think the, 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 the use of the tools and the technology today become very uh, relevant uh, to the way we understand our, our world around us. How have various art practices mm -hmm. appropriated, used, misused True. various yeah. weaponized but, technology? Yeah, you know, this is interesting because, you know, my, my background is in printmaking. And I actually, uh, but you know, I, I can't stand the smell of ink, and I don't really like the the, the texture of newsprint, which is a bad, which is just a bad uh, situation for a printmaker to be in. But I was really interested in what the print does and how the print can function. So you know, in 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 many cult, in many uh, many times in history, it was illegal to have a printing press because you could disseminate bad ideas. You could disseminate ideas that may undermine the authority of, of whichever regime you were living under. Uh, printers, even, even uh, there was a time where you know, in, in certain countries you couldn't bring in a portable printer <laughs> because it was, it was assumed that you might do something uh, that might go against their values or their ideas or, 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 you know, or you might just have some bad ideas that they don't want out. So I think uh, this thing of, so I, I've always looked at the idea of the print and how the print gets out. And maybe, maybe let's not even use the word print, maybe idea. Mm -hmm. How an idea is transmitted. And whether it be, you know, whether it be the, the printing press that Gutenberg had used in the 1450s to spread the book, or whether it be the war posters in World War II, with, uh, or whether it be the internet, that, or whether it be Twitter that took down dictators in, in uh, Egypt and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. I think they're, the, so these technologies are around, and I think artists find different ways of using technology. And uh, we, tend to, we, we tend to kind of look at things and we go, okay, well, maybe if it works this way, but if I use it this way, it'll do this. And I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated at how we misuse technology. And, I'm not, I'm, and I don't mean misuse in a negative way, but mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a lot of positive aspects of misusing technology. Because if you do what you're supposed to do with it, then it'll do what you expect it to right. do. But if you do something that it's not supposed to do, you may get an unexpected uh, That's very interesting. Can you, can you think of some examples of a kind of creative misuse like that? Yeah, you know, this is, um, I'm trying to think of what would be ideal in, in in a, in, a, in a particular example of the misuse, but I'm not exactly, not, nothing's actually clicking in my head this very moment. I wonder if there's something in your own work from uh, tracking transients, if in the, in the, the, a, a kind of misuse of a kind of surveillance well, camera think, might ref yeah. refract back on the source uh, okay. a kind of otherwise okay. hidden coercion okay. or something. So let's, let's, okay, so let's talk a little bit about misuse of it, or maybe uh, subverting the use of it, I think, is a better way of doing okay, it. Okay, right. So, historically, we've been taught to fear uh, cameras. You know, well, there's a camera watching you, so don't don't do something that you're that you don't want other people to watch you doing. So, uh, and and so let's so so you know we've been we've been we've kind of we've gotten very suspicious about the camera. But when you look at this, we're all carrying cameras with us at any given moment. 
at this moment, there's between the two of us, we probably have three or four cameras right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so when we look, so we look, so we also have this camera. So let's go back just a few years ago. Just a few years ago, it's perfectly uh, common for cameras to be confiscated at protests hmm. because you don't want the camera. You don't, you don't ah, want the picture being true. seen. Right. But these days, let them take the camera because that image is already on YouTube. <laughs> that actual action of that camera being taken away is being uploaded as it's uh, happening. Uh -huh. So there's an immediacy that's taking place. And again, it's instead of fearing it, turn the camera around, hold the mirror up. Right. And by holding that up, it changes the behavior. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, on, on another on another uh, level, a lot of states are panicking, and now there's laws that you can't record police in many states. Mm. And so, so these are just these gut reactions of, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, now there's an equalizer going on, there's this camera. Rodney King is a perfect example. The Rodney King beatings, I mean, until that video got out, that the reaction was because someone saw it, and you saw this brutal act taking place out the window, and you see this grainy, you really can't see the detail, but you know what's happening. And there's enough information in that piece of technology, that video, that well caused you know, incredible uh, suffering and, and devastation right. throughout the riots. Mm -hmm. So, I think this this idea of looking at uh, of not necessarily using the technology for what it's meant to be used, mm -hmm. I think, has had a lot of effect. Right. And sometimes we use the sometimes we just use certain ways just as a coping mechanism of trying to understand what's happening around us. And I think you know this is really interesting the idea of coping in art. Hmm. I think artists uh, you know so so maybe on a personal level the way I should uh, preface that is saying that when I first started the project I hadn't you know when I was going through the whole FBI investigation and things the last thing on my mind was hey I got new material here. It really was like I was like what just happened? And how, where was I? How close was I being to being shipped off to Gitmo? And you know that, that reality of what what did I just go through? So for me to try to understand that, oh, and to retrace that database, and rebuild that, and and just kind of backtrack and see everything in my life that happened. So in the same way, uh, and and I hope I'm not making too far of a leap here, but I think artists have always dealt with traumatic. Uh, situations, events, maybe mm -hmm. not even on an individual basis, but maybe as a group basis, mm -hmm. entire art movements have been linked to specific points in trauma. That's fascinating, absolutely. So when you look at, say, the, uh, so let's, let's say World War I, for example. I mean, here's... The birth of modern trauma. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Th there was carnage that, we had, that the world had never seen before. Right. You, had you had aircraft, aircraft for example, for the first, first time, time using warfare. warfare. So you had mm -hmm. this fire coming in from above. You had trench warfare, where fortresses had to change. Everything had to change the way. And the carnage and the wreckage that resulted in that was something that we were not psychologically ready to deal with. It was such a level of devastation that we hadn't seen. And when you look at the art that came out of there, there was something really interesting. You know, prior to World War I, the monuments were all these heroic generals on their, so on their horses and these very ornate, like you look at a Civil War monument, they're incredibly ornate. It's a very specific statuary language of this hoof means this, two feet mean this, right. the, the, the posture of the horse and the posture of the, of the general mean this. And then you look at the monuments after World War I and they're these really anonymous, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, mm. these, these iconic images that were much more sedated. Mm -hmm. And then right around that time, you're also looking at the, the birth of Dada, right. where, where the world did not make sense. And because the world did not make sense, at that time, the work that was coming up may not have necessarily made sense as well. And also, I think at a certain time, we go through certain actions, we go through cer certain experiences where we may not necessarily have the vocabulary, whether it be in language or linguistically or whether it be visually to fully articulate the the experience and sometimes we we result in these 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 movements and these points these departure points and i think in in art practice it happens all the time uh, i think that there's a really beautiful link between looking how we've coped with 
different uh, traumatic world historic events and how groups of artists have reacted to them. I think uh, you know the looking at uh, the relationship between the abstract expressionist movement in the 40s and looking at that and World War II. There's a very specific link between the two. Or take right, take right, take, right, right. Uh, take uh, minimalism and pop art. Those two are uniquely American art movements. They didn't come out of they didn't come out of Paris. Mm -hmm. They came out of the U.S. because the Korean War and the Vietnam War were both two uniquely American experiences that, you, that the U.S. was you know, this major world power at that time. We had completely changed the economic structure of the world. We completely changed the, power, the military structure of this. And, and, and the way American culture reacted to those events, I think, has a lot to do with the work that was resulted out of it. And now, granted, there were other things going on as well, but these are incredibly shaping moments in history. Sure. Now, one thing that we, I think we keep forgetting about is we are in a current state of war. We are at war right now. The U.S. has only declared war barely a dozen times in history. One of them is the war on terror. But how does, how does terror give up? How does terror say, hey guys, you win, mm. we give up? And if terror cannot give up, therefore it's a perpetual war. So if it's a perpetual war, then how does the culture react to this in perpetuity? Hmm. And I'm thinking that this constant reflection, this constant watching, this constant self-monitoring, and we do that, we all do this. I mean, you know, we've we've all kind of we've all been guilty of getting in the mirror and taking a picture and and photographing that reflection. Right. I did just the other day, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, we all do this. Right. Or you hold that camera out with your friend, you have the arm around, yeah, yeah, yeah. that angle. All right. That angle didn't exist in, in, uh, in photography until relatively recently. And right. if it did, it was very obscure. Right. But now this pose of holding the camera up in front of us and with your arm around this other person, that is so common in, 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 in photography. Now, we may just think of that as a casual snapshot of, hey, we're having a good time, let's just get our picture taken. But there's something really intrinsically built into the fact of there's this, we're looking at this lens, this lens is looking at us. We're documenting this moment. And I think this continuous uh, monitoring of the selfie, I, I really think this is the result of the war on terror, of this continuously being watched and continuously self, being aware that we're watching ourselves. And we're creating these data points that create these tracks. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it, I think this, this gives the selfie a little bit more of a, uh, of a seriousness. And yet, while most selfies may not be done in, uh, in uh, and they may be done very casually, but I think the, the whole culture, in particular with the use of the technology being so prevalent, I think this practice of per perpetual self-documentation has become much more casual and really has moved into a point where it's no longer art practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, if a billion, two billion, four billion people are doing a specific practice, is it still art? Or if, is, is it even, can you even call it a practice of any kind? You know, if it's if it part of society. I mean, you know, uh, yes, granted, just because you have a camera doesn't make you a photographer, but if you're in the process of photographing, and, we, and there are, say, billions of cameras now, it changes photography as we know it. Mm -hmm. It changes documentation as we know it. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge the role of the casual uh, participant in the arts rather than the specialist, because I think we're moving away a little bit more from the, from the role of the, of the pure specialist, right. because the pure specialist that specialty is disappearing left and right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and granted that, I'm not making a value judgment here whether that's good or bad, but there are thousands and thousands and millions and billions of people that are participating in a much broader creative practice. Uh, Fascinating. Uh, Can I ask you about a uh, uh, collection of ideas, relationships between various kinds of Big Brother, sure. representation, and yeah. reality TV? 
Yeah, so when I first started my tracking project about 10 years ago, um, the, only things that were, the only things that were being broadcast on TV at that time were reality TV shows of just this voyeurism of looking into someone else's life. Mm -hmm. Survivor, Big Brother, uh, all of these. I mean, there were a whole bunch of them. But I think Big Brother is a real watershed moment in, in media, in, in cultural history, or in recent cultural history. You're dealing with the post-9-11 era where we have all these, but well, there was something like $13 billion of cameras that popped up out of nowhere immediately after 9-11. I mean, security camera business was booming. So, so uh, afterwards, you had all of these cameras that popped up everywhere. And at that same time, it also changed the way what we thought of as entertainment. I mean, one of the things that happened after 9-11 was there was a, I mean, Hollywood basically went to Washington and said, what can we do to help? And it's no secret that the production schedule of Black Hawk Down was, was expedited to get the movie out. Oh. It was actually not supposed to come out much later. Oh, I see. So there's a, there's a way that we're, we're there, there, you know, and I'm not meaning this in a sinister way, but there is a cooperation that takes place. So I think in the same sense, in the same way how we galvanized around these ideas of, of, of citizenship and, and, and pride, we also w went in a way where we, we acknowledged and understood the camera, the surveillance camera, and looking at, say, the, the surveillance camera in Big Brother as, as celebrity. You know, it's really the first time a surveillance camera becomes a TV star, mm -hmm. and you're watching all these people in this room having a great time. They're, they're, they're having a great, you know, look at these people, and, and you're enjoying this. So we've normalized it. It's no longer the sinister thing that, that's only pointed at bad guys. And it's, you know, these people are going on with their lives. And uh, in a way, I, I guess in a lot of, uh, you could almost read as uh, my, my tracking project with this one scrolling image of this, this empty space. It almost reads like a reality TV show and you're, you're reading all of these things that's happening. So there's this level of voyeurism that's, that's built into it. And, and we're curious, we're curious beings. We want to know what's going on. So I've always found that to be fascinating, this, this link between reality TV show and micro-broadcasting. You know, as each of us have our own YouTube channels. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not that, it's, you know, in the past there were three channels and you watched this, this, or this. Right. And you watched it for this many amount of time and this many people watched it. And we have this, essentially the same math going on, but just in micro levels, where now there's, I don't know, arguably a billion YouTube channels or YouTube uh, videos, and we watch them for 12 minutes, three minutes here, 30 seconds there. We watch bits and pieces here and there. It, we still interact with the media about the same way, but just in different ways and in different intervals. So, uh, so I think this idea of looking at reality TV and looking at that in terms of uh, self-broadcast, uh, maybe if you want to call it that, micro-broadcast, or you want to look at, well, what's, it, what's, what's Twitter? What's, what's a Facebook post? This, this, uh, looking at social media in that way, I think, it's, I think that the two are very closely linked, except uh, having, say, three networks doing it, say, 40 years ago. Now there's you know, a billion people on Facebook doing it. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. How deeply do you find surveillance embedded in Western culture? Well, you know, we're certainly much more aware of it now. It's become a real big buzzword. It's, a, it's something that we're, you know, we're, we're certainly attuned to it. But, you know, we tend to think of it as being relatively recent, relatively technologically related. But, I, you know, this is, I think, very much more deep-rooted than, than something in the last few years or post-9-11. Now, granted, surveillance means something very different post-9-11 than it meant pre-9-11. And I think it's something to, to take into consideration that it's something that we've dealt with for a long, long, long time. So uh, I've been working on this project of, uh, it's, it's a whole body of work called Concordance. And essentially it's as if there's a, mo if, as if, uh, they're video, uh, they're, they're very site-specific videos. And uh, so imagine if we were standing, if we were facing a wall and if there's a video playing there, and you, didn't, and you don't really know whether you're looking at a, a still image, you don't know whether you're looking at a video, 
but imagine if you could see through that wall what you would see. So often I'll just go and make a video of the outside of the, on the other side of the wall. And that would be played back in it. But again, you don't know whether you're looking at a still image. You don't know whether you're looking at a live feed. You don't know whether you're looking at a pre-recorded feed. Right. And this is kind of interesting because when you look at surveillance imagery, most of it's pretty, well, still. There's not really much happening in it. Mm -hmm. And because most of it's not meant for human consumption. It's meant for machine consumption. Right. It's looking for that one thing that doesn't belong. It knows these are cars. Uh -huh. It knows that these are, uh -huh. this is what clouds look like. That software recognizes these things. But when the one abnormally large backpack shows up, it focuses in on that. I get it. So that's how the software knows, wait, this doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. So it looks for things that are a little off. So, so yeah, so when you're looking at most surveillance imagery, there's not much happening to them. But you know, when we say the word surveillance imagery, we tend to think of this really gritty, grainy, black and white often image. I mean, really, how many, how many of us have black and white TVs anymore? Mm -hmm. I mean, wh why, why is it even black and white? Now, granted, when it's, and even when it's color, it's kind of gritty looking. I mean, I look at the quality of that picture that my iPhone takes, and I'm looking at that camera, going, if my camera can do that quality of an image, why can't the surveillance cameras do any better? And, and the fact of the matter is, they can, but our brain rejects it. If the, image is, if the image is too clean or too clear or too high resolution, our brain doesn't read it as a surveillance image. Oh, fascinating. You know, it, we, it's so, so, uh, so the authenticity of the image is being, it, it's what causes us to reject the image. Does that have to do with our cultural position vis-a-vis oh, yeah. these older technologies? Yeah, I think right? so. Yeah. So this will change. Ab absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This, will, this will certainly change, right. but we're in that transition phase. I see. We're in that cultural transition where if it looks too clean, it, it can't be a surveillance camera. And, and it's something yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that it's fascinating. It's fascinating to think about it because we want our images to look gritty. And you know, now I think some, some video editing software even offers surveillance filters. <laughs> really? And yeah, it'll like grid it up and do all yeah, sorts of... It, 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 when you think about it, so when you think about it, well, what happens when you aestheticize that surveillance image? Well, we don't read, first, we don't read it as surveillance, and we read it as photography, or landscape photography, given that the, the stillness of most surveillance imagery. And when you look at the history of American photography, you're looking at, it was all based on measuring the West. It was, you know, those beautiful Ansel Adams photographs. They were meant to document and survey and measure the westward expansion. Uh, so you see these gorgeous images, but there was a secondary use for it. Everything was based on surveying. Uh, so this idea of measuring becomes very important. And so this idea of, of calibrating. And, and, and visually, when you look at the, the history of photography, it's very closely tied to the history of landscape painting. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, particularly in American photography and American painting, you're looking, I'm, I'm thinking very specifically of the Hudson School, uh, Hudson School River painters. You have these gorgeous grand vistas, these beautiful images of, uh, of the landscape, of the, this, 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 this watching from above. This, uh, you know, the, the, and then, of course, there was a very spiritual connection between those paintings and, and God, and the eye of God, and the, the grandeur of God. And when you look at that and compare that to, well, God being the original surveillance camera, mm. because you behaved because God was watching. Mm -hmm. So we have a history of several thousand years of, of calibrating our behavior based on God watching. So looking at, looking at the relationship between scripture and, and American painting to photography, to the camera, to the surveillance camera. So I think the, the two of them, uh, or the, the whole circle, it, it all loops back together. Fascinating. And I think, and I think we're, we're, we're much, uh, the, the idea of being watched is much more ingrained in us as humans or at least in, in, in belief, in, in, in religion, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than surveillance being a relatively new thing. Maybe we, don't, maybe we didn't call it surveillance. <laughs> but when you look at the, when you, even if you break down the word, the French root, the surveillance, watching from above. Well, right. who watches from above? All right, all right. Well, your gesture of the selfie was also yeah. 
very significantly. Yeah, you're watching from above. From above right, right. That the selfie. Whoever from above. does it like this. No one. Nobody. You, no, because you, you yeah, look terrible yeah. like that. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you have all these like things hanging down your chin. We don't want that look. <laughs> we want to look from the top. You look better from the top. Right. Yeah. Can you tell us something about machinery and the body? Sure. Embedded machinery. Sure. I think this is something that as the technology is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, it becomes much more portable. I mean, just I think the, our average phones these days have more computing power than computers that would take up an entire building uh, just a decade ago. Decades ago, yeah. And uh, so, so there's something that's happening in this, in this. So as it's getting smaller and smaller, it becomes less uh, noticeable, and we carry things around. Uh, and it also, we're externalizing a lot. So uh, this idea of uh, externalized memory. So one of the things, uh, I mean, we used to remember a lot of phone numbers. I don't know, at least I, I could oh, remember yes. 100 phone numbers off the top of my head. Right. And now I know maybe three, if that. And I have to double check them on, the, on my phone to make That's sure I'm getting the right phenomenon, one. That's yeah. And the reason is that is because I, I don't have a need to remember them. I got this gadget that does it for me. And I don't even need to look at the number. I just look at the name of it. Right. And so this idea of the memory being triggered, or, or this idea of externalizing the memory. So one of the things that was to happen, say, in ancient Greece, there was the whole concept of the memory theater, where people would recite entire epics. And they would basically stand in a space, and the area, the, the location, the, the, the details of the theater would trigger the memory, and they would be able to, well, download that chapter. And they would recite that chapter. And they would move to another part of the memory theater, and they would recite the next chapter. And, the next, and as papyrus became more prevalent, there was no need to remember them because you could write them down. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, when I used to remember 100, 200 phone numbers, there's no reason for me to do it anymore. It's there. So it's all externalized. And I can call it up at any given moment. And any time I need to look up, I mean, I'm sure we do this in conversation. Hey, what was, oh, well, let's, we'll just look it up on Google. Right. And you go on your phone and you type in a few things and there it is. And it gives you exactly the, what you were trying to remember. And you can put the craziest search terms in it. It'll, it'll figure out what you mean. Right. So I think that's kind of important is how we externalize these things. And it's almost, it seems sci-fi. It seems so, so futuristic thinking, but we do it. But it's really no, you know, it's like, I think I'm sure a few generations ago, when we used to talk about invisible eyeglasses. You know, it's probably no different than, you know, we're, here, we're carrying our brains around in, a, in our pocket. Right. <laughs> but you know, those invisible eyeglasses, you know, no one calls contact lenses invisible eyeglasses. We don't even think about them as technology. Right. We don't even think about our phones as technology. We, we just, well, I just, just use them. It just, yep. We just use them. We don't think of our bank cards as this really sophisticated uh, machinery system or this network. I mean, I don't know if too many people that get in line at the bank these days to make a deposit. You just don't do it. I mean, everything's, everything's invisible. Right. And I think as more and more of this stuff is, becomes invisible, the more, the more it's dematerialized, the more we don't think of it as technology, we just think of it as life. What, what are some of the consequences of this uh, systemic externalization? Yeah, you know, the, 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 this is a really interesting thing because as, as we've evolved for thousands, if not millions of years, uh, we've learned to do certain things. We've learned to walk upright for certain reasons. You know, we, we, we do certain things. We, we learn to cook food because, well, not only it tastes a little better, it won't kill us. Something like that, uh, yeah. of, of those types. So those are some of the things. Now, the other thing is, you know, I'm thinking about this idea of having permanent memory. If it's externalized, if it's on a machine, my phone will not forget that phone number. And in the same way, you know, Gmail doesn't forget my emails. It's there. Uh, I mean, I don't, even, I don't even delete my spam. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Gmail does something to it. It's there. <laughs> but, and when I need it, I do my search, and it pops up. But there are certain things that are good to forget. I mm. mean, this, this uh, you know, we've, the whole process of mourning. I mean... There's a reason why we have this. There's a reason why we've developed uh, as thousands and millions of years of mourning. What if that was a permanent state? Mm. What if it never went away? So there are certain things that are good to forget, but in, in a binary world, in, in a digital, it's either yes, you forget it, or you don't forget it. Mm. Unless you hit delete, it will not forget it. 
You know, a lot of folks, uh, you know, the, you hear things about people breaking up and they'll delete them off their phone. Oh, yes. It's a symbolic gesture yes, yes, of yes. deleting. Fascinating. Gone. That is fascinating. So, so, but if you never have a need to delete, you never have a need to forget. And if everything is permanently remembered, that, that changes our behavior, and we're going to need to figure yeah, out how to deal with that. I could imagine that might produce, or it might relate in some interesting way to the very beginning of our conversation yeah. on trauma, on, yeah. on some level, a trauma of the everyday. I think so, yeah. I, and I think it, it happens a lot. I mean, a lot of times you'll, put in, you'll search for, for something in your email, and an old, old, old email will pop up from someone you've completely forgotten about. Mm -hmm. And then everything is triggered. Fascinating. So, yeah, and, yeah. and I think that, and I, I'm sure I'm not the only person that this happens to. I'm sure we all experience oh, this. Oh, absolutely. So, this, so I think this idea of this perpetual war and perpetual memory and perpetual archive are all very closely tied together. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's a, a good point with which to conclude and to thank you very much. Thank you. It's great talking to you. Thank you.